Hey, what's up guys? Welcome back to the channel. We've got a difficult install today. As you see here in front of me, this is actually a curved barn door opening. As if barn doors can't be complicated enough already, now we have to put them on curved walls. So in this video, we're gonna be building this curved header detail, which I made out of poplar laminations. I'll show you how to do that in the shop. And then also, as you come around here to this side, we also have a curved piece of casing that I, made, that I had to make going across the top here. So stay tuned in this video, lots of tips and tricks, different stuff I'm gonna teach you, show you, um, and kind of just ramble through myself. I never know exactly uh, how things are gonna go, but I'm pretty happy with how this install came together. Now, in order to bend our header piece for this barn door, I had to figure out how am I gonna make a form um, for something this long, it's almost 14 feet long here. So it was kind of a unique situation to be able to make a form for something that large. I ended up having a sheet of uh, OSB on the job site. So as you see under me here, I ripped it in half and I put the two pieces together, made sure my factory edge is together nice and tight here on the side. And what I opted to do was just scribe the wall to this plywood. So I cut a block approximately whatever I thought I needed, put it on the wall, and then slide it along the wall like, like so. And this is what traced um, my radius in order to make the form in the shop. Now it's pretty easy to scribe the radius of the wall where we actually have a wall to work with. The problem gets to be once we get to the opening, then how are we going to transfer this arch down onto this OSB? What I ended up, <coughs> what I ended up doing was just using this new Milwaukee laser. It's been working out great for me. One of the handy features that it has is a plumb dot feature. So essentially I just lined up my plumb dot up here uh, on the front side of my drywall, transferred my mark down onto the OSB. So I made a bunch of those lines here across this OSB. And then I simply took the same piece of plywood and scribed my line going along here like so. Now you'll see here along this front edge where I've got these different marks where I plumbed down from the top. So then again, I was able to just use um, the block that I was using to transfer the line over and then scribe this big radius line on top of here. So making a form with a radius, uh, this was definitely a quick way to do it. There are some downfalls to doing it this way, one being that my wall might not be plumb. So I might be scribing something down here on the floor that isn't exactly the same up where I'm gonna put my header. Also issues with framing, you know, kicking things out. The radius isn't quite perfect and you can even see it's got some odd little bumps in it along the way. So I had to decide either I do it like this or I pull the measurements off of the blueprint and actually get real complicated with how I make the radius in the shop. I could have probably done it that way. I ended up just doing it this way. It worked out fine, thankfully, but uh, it's just something to think about if you ever have to do this. There are more precise ways to do things, but sometimes I take the fast route and kind of keep my fingers crossed. So at this point, I took my plywood templates and uh, went to the shop set up a nice form in my shop and bent these laminations there. So that's what you're gonna see next. All right guys, so getting started in the shop, the first thing we need to do in order to make our, or bend our curved trim, we need to have some laminations that are thin enough to actually bend and then we can glue them up uh, on our form. To do that, I just used regular one by material and uh, resawed those, basically just ripped them in half on the bandsaw. This is my Laguna 18BX. Uh, I don't use it a ton, but it works really well for me whenever I need it. And in situations like this, where I essentially just need to uh, rip a one by in half, it works pretty well for that. 
I don't use the bandsaw often, so I just leave it up against the wall uh, most of the time, and then I've got a hose for it, and then I actually just use the cord for my jointer. It uses the same uh, style of plug, um, and just pull my cord over to this whenever I need it. So not a super ideal situation, but for me, it works pretty well considering I don't have to use this very often. I feel like I could probably have a better blade uh, that'd be a little bit better suited for resawing stuff like this. It's a little slow going, and uh, this definitely doesn't leave a great finish as far as that goes, but it gets the job done. It's just a little bit slow feeding through with this. I'd imagine if I had a, a bigger blade with less teeth, uh, maybe a little bit better designed for resawing, it would uh, go a little bit quicker for me. But anyways, at this point, we've got a bunch of our laminations here. So what I need to do is I need to flip these over and I'm gonna run them all through the planer to get a nice uniform thickness uh, and then get a nice smooth surface for gluing these up. So guys, one of the reasons I positioned this planer right here between my two large overhead doors is because I've also got a direct line to this uh, entry door over here. That way, if I need to plane 16 foot material, I can open the door and have a nice long path here throughout the whole shop. Just one of those things, you know, you gotta make do with what you've got in terms of space. And that was a really important design element whenever I put the planer here um, that I thought of and it's worked really well for me. Just another quick tip here, a lot of you already know, but if you've got limited space in your shop, keep everything you can on wheels. That way you can load stuff up against the wall and then just pull it out whenever you need it. So in this case, like with my bandsaw, uh, my shaper, my router table, all of this stuff is very easy just to pull out whenever I need it. All right guys, at this point, I've got my form all set up on the table. Let me give you a little bit closer look at what we've got going on here. So again, in the spirit of working efficiently, this was just a sheet of OSB that was on the job site that I laid down on the floor and then scribed the wall onto the sheet so that I could make uh, this form slash template out of it. I've got this OSB screwed down to my table here so it's not gonna move. That way we uh, keep everything lined up the way it should be. And then as you see here, I just cut a bunch of blocks out of some scrap plywood. We've got pocket hole screws here, two screws going down in, holds these nice and stug, snug. And then these are just some standoff blocks that will set our bent laminations onto. That'll, <coughs> that'll allow me to get a clamp under here and squeeze down on these to get them all aligned if I need to do that. Now I do have two different laminations that I would really like to glue up at once. This long one here is for the barn door header. So ideally I'd like to put that on the back side, get some clamps on it, and then quickly glue up uh, this whole set here which is for the opposite side, and it'll just be a standard casing that is bent to conform to the, the curve of this radius. So I'm not exactly sure how this is gonna go. Again, I'd like to be able to glue up both of these at the same time, which would mean putting this long set on the back side, throwing some clamps on it, and then trying to glue up this other set right here and putting that across the front and then just putting clamps across both sections at once. Um, then that way they could both cure overnight and then I could mill them in the morning and take them to the job site tomorrow for installation. So we'll see how this goes. All right, I've got my long one all uh, wrapped up, glued up in plastic wrap. I think the plastic wrap helps to uh, keep the whole thing compressed and tight together as you bend it around the forms. So I'm gonna try and get this on, throw a couple clamps on it, and I'll do my shorter section and then clamp the whole thing up. All right, I'm actually pretty happy. Got that long one glued up. It's looking really good. So I'm gonna real quick try and get this 
shorter section glued up, wrapped up, and clamped down. I just try and kind of smear, I mean, I try to spread the glue as quickly as I can, which is why I'm dumping it versus trying to squeeze it all out. Then I'm using this foam, <coughs> foam roller to get things spread out as evenly as possible. It works pretty well. And then you'll also notice as I'm gluing, I, <coughs> I am gluing both sides of the pieces that are gonna join up to each other. Um, it's gonna make so that you get a better bond. You have a wet edge on both sides and just a better chance of everything kind of going together well. And then that goes back again to using that foam roller. We wanna try and get as even of a coat as possible without any globs or anything like that because uh, we want our laminations to go together evenly. As I roll, <coughs> I'm not just rolling in one direction, I'm kind of uh, alternating my angle and that helps spread the glue all over the piece a little bit more evenly. Put our last piece together here and then uh, I'll get everything lined up on the ends as best I can. And then we'll start <coughs> wrapping it with our plastic wrap. We are all glued up now, and I'm pretty happy with how everything went together. Didn't have any issues, got it clamped up. Um, it's kind of hard to explain the role that the plastic wrap plays, but it just kind of helps everything stay aligned, keeps glue from getting everywhere, holds everything together, provides some like continuous clamping pressure around everything, but uh, it's worth doing in my opinion. Not that I do this all the time, but uh, whenever I do do it, it always seems like the, the plastic wrap is key to uh, kind of helping everything go smoothly. So it's looking good. I'm gonna let this set up and cure. I'd like to install this tomorrow, so I might be pushing it to take it off the clamps that soon. We'll just have to see. So guys, aside from making these radius casing pieces and header pieces for our barn door, I also have a radius jam that I have to make, uh, which is what you see here. Now, I'm not sure how well, uh, if you'll be able to see this or not, but I've got pencil lines going along here. Um, and this is gonna be the top piece of my jam in my cased opening. So what I did was I just took a wide board. This was a one by 12. I cut it to the length that I needed with the appropriate angles on it, and then actually just put it up in the opening. And then I took my pencil and just traced the drywall onto this board so that I can um, mill the radius onto this for my cased opening. So because I was basically just tracing the drywall with my pencil, this line, it's, it's conforming to the wall, but it also is conforming to any of the imperfections in the drywall. So I'm gonna show you a little technique on how you can get this radius uh, nice and perfect. So essentially what I want to do here is I wanna make sure that whenever I cut this, that my radius is nice and gradual and it's got a nice sweeping uh, motion to it the whole way. Because uh, I traced the drywall, we've got some undulations in here that I wanna get rid of. So what we wanna do is take a piece of material that's somewhere between flexible and stiff. So this is a piece of half inch fly plywood ripped a half inch wide. And as you can see, it's got some flex to it, but 
as I bend it, it's going to kind of keep that nice sweeping arch. So what we want to do is come up to our pencil line here, and I want to just kind of start tacking this down, and I want to bend it ever so gradually this whole way. The idea here is that this will kind of uh, keep that sweeping motion. So now we've got a nice sweeping arch here that I can run my router bit against and uh, that'll work really well. Now I have another line here and I could do the same thing, but there would be the potential that this might not be parallel the whole way. So I know what my overall jam des desired jam width is. So I just subtracted a half inch from that and cut a spacer block. And what I'll do now is I'll go along here and I'll scribe a line on here. And then this will ensure that I'm running perfectly parallel with these two edges the whole way. Uh, and it'll just look a lot better to the eye. At this point, we want to use a jigsaw to trim along our, our template curved piece here, but we want to leave it about a 16th or an eighth of an inch proud, and then we'll finish removing the rest of this material with a flush trim bit on a router. So what we'll do after we've cut uh, both sides with the jigsaw is we'll flip the piece upside down, and then we'll use the flush bit to ride along uh, our curved piece and we'll get a nice clean edge that's perfect. We'll start with a climb cut spinning with the material that way we don't get any tear out and then we'll finish coming back the other way, going against the material. Now we'll flip it, hit the other side. And so you can see that's just a really nice way to route a radius and keep a nice, clean, uh, consistent edge. See just a very nice cut along there and it conforms to that uh, piece we pinned on there really nicely. And then after you're done, you just pop that piece off, <coughs> bend your pins back and forth to break those off. 
Uh, and that's just a method that works really well. I've done this quite a bit with arch beams and things like that. Uh, it's just a really nice way to get a nice gradual arch. So that's it for today until I can take these clamps off. I'm a little concerned. Uh, I got my jam routed out here and it's actually not lining up uh, quite as well as I would like with my floor template. So hopefully I can make that all work but we're going to find out once <coughs> once we get it to the job site. But uh, it's not quite matching up uh, with my template as closely as I would like. All right, guys, we're back on the job site. Um, I went ahead and broke all of these curved trims down in the shop and milled them up and uh, just brought them out here. Didn't get all that on film, but uh, hopefully you can forgive me for that. So. I'm trying to make sure that this is all going to work together at this point and it's kind of tricky because we've got a stone veneer that's going to be going on the outside of this wall. So my casing for the rest of the house is 5 8 of an inch thick, which you see here, but I need it to be thicker on the outside so that we can lay our stone up to it. So what I ended up doing was making this custom trim so that I've got five eighths on my front side, but then I've got it thicker on the back side here. And essentially we'll be able to lay that over the jam and then the stone can lay up against here. Now I've went ahead and actually already started fitting this curved piece of casing that goes across the top here. And again, here's my curved uh, head jam. I actually have to admit, I did have to make this twice. The first time I made this, I made it, I just took the one by 12, I stuck it up here, I took my pencil out and I traced it out. The problem is the framers did not do me any favors with the way they framed this. Uh, it's not consistent and I had issues because this did not match the template that I made on the floor. So I ended up having to remake this head jam piece to match my casing and now it's not quite perfect with what the framers left me on the wall, but we're trying to make it work. So at this point, and you guys can probably even see the curved up here in the ceiling. You remember these ceiling trays that we did in a previous video. Um, so this casing had to be bent in order to match the radius on this wall. At this point, I've got my miters cut. I'm going to go ahead and fit these jam legs onto the sides. And then we need to go around to the opposite side and try and get the jam uh, positioned correctly so that we can put this long headpiece in for our barn door. I've got my miters cut and to do these miters, we're just gonna use glue and uh, clam clamps, not really throwing a biscuit in um, because it is a little bit of a narrower profile situation here, but this is a stain grade install. This is all going to be stained. So I want to make sure that uh, everything is going together as good as it possibly can, knowing that we're not going to have any uh, caulk joints to fix our mistakes. I like to just throw a couple nails at the base of that miter there and then get the clam clamp up here in place. Give it a nice squeeze. That looks really good. Now at this point, I've got my casing on the, the outside here of this wall. And on the inside here, this is gonna be actual barn doors. So I made that really long header piece. And the trick with all of this is I'm trying to get the inside of my jam to flush out with this drywall. Full disclosure, what I made in the shop whenever I got here today, I actually had this casing much thicker 
And uh, as soon as I started test fitting things together, I realized that if I would have left my casing thickness where it was at, my jam would have sat inside the drywall way too far, like up to a quarter inch even. So I did have to rip off the back side of that over here, which allowed the whole jam to push in a little bit more. Not a big deal, we're just kind of rolling with the punches. But at this point, I've got a couple casing legs cut here. I'm gonna fasten these and then get this uh, kind of situated where I want it and then we'll take a look at this big header piece up top. Our next step is to kind of secure our jam legs here. We're gonna have this huge piece I've gotta get installed across the top, but first I wanna tack this in place. Now, you've kind of probably picked up, I've got some margin and some spacing where this jam will move one way or the other. And what I wanna do now is nail this side of the casing tight to the wall, which is gonna leave us a gap here, and that's okay because this stone material is going to get installed on the wall and it'll cover this gap on the back side. But this gap is really something that I wanted because it give, gives me the flexibility that I need to get this fit the way I want it to um, all the way across the entire opening. Now at this point, this is what I glued up in the shop. This is our barn door header. Uh, the barn door track hardware will mount to this. So I essentially just need to make two cuts on the ends to get it to my desired length. To make this installation a little bit easier, we're going to want to mark our center point. Uh, that way I know where the center of this whole apparatus is when I go to install it. And to do that, I'm just kind of guesstimating where I think the center is. So I'm marking at 79 inches and then pulling from the opposite side at the same measurement. And then between those two marks, you can mark your center and know exactly where your center is at. Okay, moment of truth. I do know this has got some spring back because I took the, the whole thing off of the form and I've just kind of had it sitting in my shop. So it has had some time to bounce back a little bit from where I bent it originally, but it's such that I think I'll be able to use some nails and screws and get the ends to pull in. The most important thing is right here. I want this to be nice and tight and I'm happy with what I'm seeing um, across here so far. So I'm gonna just throw some clamps on it. Get that nice and tight. There we go. You will notice as I was installing this, our center marks here on the jam and on the piece of casing made it easy to get that exactly where it needs to be. So I've got equal distance hanging over on both sides. So guys, I actually got a little bit ahead of myself. Whenever I uh, was putting the casing legs on, I should have taken a little bit more care to ensure that the top of these casing legs were perfectly level, but I went ahead, just threw my laser on top of my ladder over here and uh, checked everything. And it's not too bad, it's not perfect, but whenever we go ahead and screw our barn door track hardware up here to the top of this, we'll be able to move it a little bit here and there to get it exactly where it needs to be so it's nice and level and you won't ever see it. So I'm... I'm
So you've probably heard of spring back whenever you clamp um, wood material and bend it, glue it up, a lot of times it will want to bounce back from what your actual form uh, was set at. And here you've got a little bit of it, but it, it still bends nicely and it's still gonna suck up to the wall nicely, but just something I wanted to show a little bit. We'll go ahead and try and nail this off. So you can see it's nice and tight all along here now. So it's looking pretty good. So guys, I was kind of fighting the drywall and some framing here, trying to get this side tight. So this is a trick um, you've maybe seen me use before, using a washer head screw and then a shim. And uh, you can drill into it and the shim just acts as a weight distribution so that you don't make an indentation using a screw like this but two screws, it pulled everything in nice and tight. So now I can go ahead and nail this off and it looks a whole lot better than it did before. Whenever I have to use this trick to use screws to pull something in that's stain grade, I really like these GRK cabinet screws because the shank on them is so narrow that it ends up being about the same size hole as a 15 gauge finish nail if you use that shim trick that I just showed you. So up there, didn't leave any giant screw holes. It's the same size as a 15 gauge hole. Uh, it works really well. Last step on kind of finishing up this install would be to nail off the other side here of my opening. So this is the mitered side with the curved head casing. The main thing was I just wanted to make sure that it was nice and plumb. So I made it plumb. And then there is this gap on the back side here. Again, that's gonna be covered by the stone that will go along here but it was really important to have that to give me that margin for error that I needed, uh, just that safety net, because I didn't wanna to try to make everything too tight with trying to get these different casing details to come together nice and tight across the top. Again, with stain grade, you've got no forgiveness in terms of using caulk, but we truly have a very tight joint on both sides where my head casing meets on both sides. So I'm really happy with how it came together. So guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. This is one of those custom trim details um, that I end up having to do a lot. It takes a pretty fair amount of time, but it is important to be able to execute details like this whenever the builder needs you to be able to. In all, I'm really happy with the head piece um, being stain grade. It's gonna stain up nice and everything installed really crisply with all of my um, connections to the drywall. We don't have any big gaps or anything like that. So happy with how it came together. Hopefully you guys learned something. Let me know what you think in the comments. If you've got any questions or anything like that, I always appreciate hearing from you. So thanks for watching. We'll see you on the next video.